Why, yes, I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Getting geeky in Little Rock. It's Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Uh, thanks so much for joining. This is, first and foremost, Geek Talk Radio. Uh, it's normally live on Saturdays at 1 p.m. Central on 101.1 FM, the answer in the Little Rock, Central Arkansas area. Of course, we stream, I guess, really worldwide, uh, 101.1 or 101.1 FM, the answer.com. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll get messages from people all over the world, and that's always encouraging to know that, you know, the geekdom is, is connecting us out there. Um, and then, of course, after the live show or after the radio broadcast, if it's pre recorded, then we go out as a podcast and uh, on Krypton Radio and on YouTube and, and other venues. So it is it is the best of both worlds. And no matter how you're listening, I'm just darn glad you're here today. I'm going to make a bad pun. Today's topic is no laughing matter. So my my guest, Dr. Travis Langley, gave me the sideways look on that one. So like I'm not going. I purposefully am not going to laugh even to. Uh, even to uh, give you approval or endorsement as the host, so which I respect. So, uh, oh, I just didn't want to <laughs> laugh over you. <laughs> well, you could if you want. If this is uh, <laughs> Shane plays geek talk. Is it, is it, if it's not almost a train wreck, it's not Shane plays. So anyway, uh, got Travis Langley on the show. I think I was going to go look, but I'm pretty sure I think this is your third time on the show. That sounds right. Because you came on way back in the day. And we talked about Harley Quinn and Batman psychology. And somehow Star Wars wandered into there, too. Star Wars wandered in. Uh, and then you came on. We talked about Wonder Woman mm-hmm. psychology. And, and then today we're talking about really, I mean, one of the most enduring and and fascinating, not just characters in comic books, but fictional characters, period, the Joker. So you've got a new book. Ostensibly, it's it's yet to release, but it's basically out there. Right? Yeah, Amazon shipping it, and Barnes you know, and Noble always gets them about a week earlier. Right. So it's it's the Joker psychology, evil clowns, and the women who love them. Yeah. So, and that's not a description of several of my dates when I was younger. This is this is. Were you the clown or the women? I both oh. in my head. Yeah. So uh, that's that's how crazy I was. No, uh, evil clowns and the women who love them. So this is uh, these books that you do. These you've had uh, Batman Psychology, A Dark and Stormy Night, K N I G H T. You've done Wonder Woman. You've done The Walking Dead. This is number thirteen. Number thirteen. So what are some of the other ones you've done out there? So uh, started with Batman and Psychology, A Dark and Stormy Night, which I was right. the sole author. Right, and after it did so well, other nerdy psychologists said they would like to be involved. So the the you rest mean that are in, there's a whole world of nerdy psychology. There's a world psychology of nerdy psychology, okay. and we find more all the time. And I okay. once they know that I'm the guy who did the Batman book, they approach me. So since then, we've done twelve anthologies, mm. and it varies as to how much I write. In. So I'm the head nerd of the herd on the series. The this one, nerd. I wrote about two thirds of the book myself. Okay, uh, if. We'd had two more months lead time. It would have been ninety percent. Is that because you're so fascinated by this character, or why would you have been? Why were you so involved with this one compared to some previous ones? Well, it is. Um, I'm. I've often been called a Batman expert, which sounds very strange when I hear it, but <laughs> okay. it, it comes up a lot. So I know okay. the history. I know. The kind of things we need to say, and I just want to say these things. I, just, I love can't. analyzing these characters and the history. Every single one of the books we work on uh, is special to me. You're asking what they all are. It's, uh, so was, there was, out of the anthologies, the first was The Walking Dead Psychology, uh, Psych of the Living Dead, followed by Star Wars Psychology, Dark Side of the Mind, Captain America versus Iron Man, Freedom that was Security a good Psychology. One. Yeah. And yeah. That was our shorts. That was the first one where we had a forward by Stan Lee. Yeah, I remember that was great. Because for a while... At comic conventions, you were handing out buttons. Mm-hmm. Iron Man was safety, and Captain America was freedom. I think uh, Iron Man was security. So security, you had the, so you yeah. Got the idea, yeah. And you said that the Captain America buttons were going far. They were far more yeah, popular. Yeah, far than more. Pro- and you were giving them away for free, right? Yeah, we're just yeah. giving them away. So that was kind of interesting. Yeah. 
Uh, so followed by uh, Game of Thrones psychology. The mind is dark and full of terrors. It is. Doctor Who psychology. A madman with a box. Wonder Woman psychology. Last the truth. Star Trek psychology. The mental frontier. Supernatural psychology. Rose less traveled. Westworld psychology. Violet Delights, Daredevil Psychology, The Devil You Know. I know I left one out in there somewhere. Uh, yeah, no, that's fine, but that's pretty good just yeah, off the cuff. The so now uh, I've, I've, I got to ask you real quick on the Westworld one. Mm-hmm. Uh, did did you go into the original movie at all, or did you just stick Not to the really. series? I figured we would talk about both the movie and the series, right. but we wound up uh, really just talking about uh, the HBO series right. because it had. The stories, it had the depth of character. The original Westworld wasn't so much about the characters. It was about the phenomenon, the mm-hmm. fear of what happens when our technology goes bad, mm-hmm. which which we refer to the original movie in that regard, but it's always also connected to the HBO TV series, mostly about season one. Uh, season one raised more psychological issues for us to talk about than season two did. I right. think just season one answered enough questions that right. we weren't wondering about things the same way in season two. Well, the, the little, now I haven't watched the TV show and we're here to talk about Joker folks, but I just, I'm curious Westworld for some reason, that whole concept is just really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, what little I know of the series, the in this case, the androids don't know that they're androids. Right. Right. That's and then, and then there's like a dawning awareness that we're we're not people and we're just, you know, like they live the same day over and over or something like and that. And it gets yeah. into those issues of what is sentience what is a human being Mm -hmm. as our ai becomes more advanced is there the point where we're going to have to make judgments regarding these things we're building ourselves and then how will they judge us right yep interesting okay well i want to let people know real quick where we're doing this uh, i think this is the second week we've done this where uh we are using uh, uh the dave ellswick show video uh, the live in studio video is out there right now. So if you want to, if you're, if it's, if if you're listening live, you're you're on Facebook right now. Where? Wave, wave right there. Yay! There. Oh, there. So there yeah, there's the book. Yeah, I'm holding up the book to the camera right now. So. I felt like I did when I was on Wheel of Fortune, initially looking in the wrong direction. Oh, there's the camera. So you're on Wheel, Wheel of Fortune. How did when that, I was in grad school. Where, how'd that go? I won everything. Did you really? I did. Was that fun? Oh, it was so much fun. It was awesome. I, look, I mean, I look grim through a lot of the, the taping <laughs> because I am focused. I had right. a wife and two little kids. I was a graduate student. We needed a car. You needed we some needed some money. money. And yeah, that was a wonderful experience. Yeah. Hold on a second. Zach, what are you trying to tell me, Zach? I didn't catch your... He's saying get... I can I can bring my mic closer. He me. can, you can. I can be right here. You're right. You can get right up on it. Like it. we were talking earlier right. in the show or before the show started about how when Mark Hamill unleashes his Joker laugh, that he. In fact, we're here in a second, Zach. Play it. But when when Mark Hamill unleashes his Joker laugh, he gets right up on the mic. Yeah. So Kevin Conroy was telling me it looks like he's about to eat the mic. About to eat the mic. So let's hear that laugh. <laughs> Where does that even come from? That is crazy. That's some serious voice voice acting right there. But yeah, folks, if you go to the Dave Ellswick show page, if you're listening live, you can watch the the video, the the fascinating video of Dr. Travis Langley and I just looking at each other and talking to microphones or and now he's gazing like a vampire into the uh into the microphone or into the camera okay so tell us a little bit uh we i i don't have a news segment today i don't i don't it's all it's all joker so tell us a little bit about what people can find in the joker psychology evil clowns and the women who love them yeah ever since i wrote the batman book people have been asking about that one more than anything else are you gonna do a book about the joker they've been asking that repeatedly and for a long time i had thought well, obviously, we could fill a, jo- a book about the Joker, but we don't know what goes on inside his head. In, in but that's about, part of the fascination. And that is. For yeah. storytelling purposes, it's best that way. We do not need to know his definite background. And that always felt to me like something would be missing. I need something a little more grounded. Obviously, in real life, there are criminals who we don't know what 
goes on in their heads. We don't know when we can ever believe them, and we still need to try to understand them. We need to, or at least try to anticipate or figure out how to catch them. So they're mm-hmm. still worth study. But once uh, my publishers published it, we were talking about this a couple of years ago. We decided two years before we did this book that we were going to do it. And the publisher said, what don't you make about the Joker and Harley? It's like, okay, it's still mostly about the Joker, but Harley Quinn gives us something grounded because we do know a lot of what goes on in her head. And there is something optimistic with her. You know, we can mm-hmm. talk about where there might be room for somebody to get better. The last chapter in the book is on therapy. And for that one, it's mostly written by a bunch of different therapists, about a dozen different therapists talking about specific kinds of therapy. Will this one help the Joker? No. Will that one help the Joker? No. Will that one? No, that will make him worse. Uh, but mm-hmm. some of them might help someone such as Harley, even someone who's done terrible things, you know, when they're in the right place, the right state of mind, motivated to change and have social support. And, and that led us head in a more optimistic and, direction and, at the end. And, and that's good for the real world, honestly. Yes. I mean, we don't want people like the Joker in the real world. Right. Uh, we want people to to get cured or to get better or to at least maybe minimize the demons inside or whatever, however you want to call but there it. There are yeah. people who yeah. clearly will never be productive human beings. While we don't use the word evil in psychology, there right. are some people who are evil. There right. are psychopaths who honestly no, what I'm saying is like sometimes the therapy can make it worse. It's true. There's some mm. especially group therapy, there there some therapeutic approaches that help some manipulative psychopathic individuals get a better idea of what other people want to hear right. in order to fool them. Right. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it, it gets them better at playing the game. Right. And yeah. that was some of what was disturbing and uncomfortable when working on the book. I had to look at a lot of real life right. serial criminals while not talking about them generally by name. Uh, BTK, I never mentioned him by name. I'll ref- when I have to, right. I refer to him as BTK. There is the... The young man who shot up the theater in Aurora, Mm -hmm. who I know some people would assume that we would have talked about him in here because he said he was the Joker, but he didn't really say that. Mm. Uh, He's not referred to until the afterward when I bring up. Why didn't we bring him up? Because he didn't say that. It was a myth. Uh, Someone had misreported it at the beginning, but it still perpetuated that he claimed to be the Joker. Mm. But but now he did, and it could just be a coincidence. He targeted, was it a Dark Knight Rises? Yeah, it was uh, the Dark Knight Rises. uh, uh, Showing. Uh, and he had like the crazy and I, I could see why people would have thought that he was claiming to be because he had the crazy colored hair he had that orange hair yeah. when he went to court yeah. and but it, and there had been someone at the time when it happened claimed that he'd said he was he, he claimed he said I'm the Joker but he didn't say that and so that throws yeah, off what that a lot does of people throw it off. we don't know yeah. what was going on with him mm. Well, and, that, and that's the problem or the challenge or whatever you want to call it if somebody's truly psychopathic we can't relate. We can't right. because uh, they, they're just operating on a whole different, you know, you take away somebody's empathy and that, that creates a whole different set of motivations and expect, you know what I mean? You can't, it's really hard to relate. Yeah. To, I interviewed you know, a uh, retired FBI profiler, Mike, Mark Safarik, uh, for, and it, it's, it's in there in two parts as bonus features after some chapters. Right. And he said that one of the problems when we're looking at some of these psychopathic individuals, especially the worst ones, is that because we're not like them, we don't even understand what it's like to be missing the things that they're missing. We still tend to try to interpret them in terms of people who make sense to us. And that's part of how people end up following for these killers, those who get romantically interested in these people who've done atrocious things. When we start talking about how can a psychiatrist as smart as Harley Quinn fall for the Joker? Well, therapists do mm-hmm. fall for in clients. Well, they, they seem powerful in a certain way. Yes. Right. Cause they're outside of the normal rules and they play their own game and you know, they'll do what they want to do and, and that kind of thing. And that kind of confidence is appealing. Yeah. Yeah, to some people. It's yeah. naturally attractive in a lot of ways. Confidence is attractive. Sure. And a lot of people will mistake that indifference to everybody else for normal confidence. So there are therapists who get involved with their clients, whether they should or not. There are people who work in the prison systems that get involved right. with inmates. And there are a lot of people who have fallen for the, the bad boy or the bad girl, even though they're smart enough to know they shouldn't. Right. They're also smart enough to come up with rationalizations to explain it away. Right. And I mean, you know, that uh, whether 
they meant to or not, like Paul Denny created the perfect textbook example of that with Harley Quinn, Mm -hmm. right? He did. Yeah, and we had a great discussion, I think the first time you came on, on the differences in Harley Quinn acting under her own agency and then kind of her agency was taken away by the creators and how she became Harley and all that stuff. So Paul Dini's version of her origin is the best right. version the man she story. decided she decided i shall become harley quinn i shall embrace this yeah. she decided to break the joker out of arkham and other versions adam glass's version i've got an interview with adam glass in there yeah. where we talk about this yeah he takes some of that agency away from harley in that version of the story right, right. which is a, 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 as we put it a couple of years ago it's a bummer but it is what it is so uh and i mean harley just keeps coming on strong there's a tv show mm-hmm. being made for dc universe online there's a new Harley, uh, I don't know if it's a young adult uh, graphic novel coming series. I there don't are know. some. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, Harley's just... Harley is most popular yeah. when she has broken away from the Joker. Right. That's what people love to see in her, Right. is when she's standing up on her, whether she's doing it as a criminal or a right. hero or an anti-hero. Just whatever. Yeah. People enjoy her the most when she's gone away from the Joker. So, yeah, and, and I want... You know, last thing I'll say about Harley, so we can, you know, I want to keep it focused on your book and the topic of your book, but, well, I guess she's in here, but... <laughs> yes, she is. She's in here. I, you know, a lot of people are down on the Suicide Squad movie, the first one, not the one they're making now. And it's an okay movie. It's it's an action movie, whatever. Stuff goes boom. Uh, there's super villains. But I loved, I really liked the Joker and Harley stuff. Uh, if you watch the Blu-ray or DVD release, they put more footage back in it, mm-hmm. evolving the Joker. And there's a really good Bonnie and Clyde stuff going on in there. And, and there's a scene where, you know, he's, he's like, I'm not asking if you'd live for me. He's like, would you die for me? And then that's before she jumps into the, the chemicals or whatever, uh, or he throws her in or whatever. Yeah, and, the, and, and, and the it, movie came yeah. up with this midpoint that right. gave her more agency right. than Adam's comic book right. version did. Yeah, she was like, basically, yes. And he said, okay, well, and then he throws her into the... But I love that 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 scene between them is was really good. And I, I don't think the Joker and Harley stuff gets enough credit in Suicide Squad. The rest of the movie is just a B movie, you know, just an average it's action It's an adventure. Movie. It's yeah, it's watchable. an adventure movie. But, uh, but I, you know, I, I did like it. And I guess as long as we're on... The theme, or, or talking about the Suicide Squad movie, the first one. What what was your take, or do you cover that ver that kind of meth head, crazy Joker ver? Do y'all go into that at all? It's in the there, kind but of- not much because it's not. Even aside from what people think of that role, it's that version of the Joker is not the one that stands out in the history. That's not the one right. people talk about when they think of the Joker. Yeah, he's sort. I mean, I take it he's like sort of a meth head gangster in that one yeah. is also sort of how- it's incomplete yeah. we don't know for sure where he's going or why he's doing these things like at the end of the movie spoiler alert yeah uh, when he breaks her out of jail right now that's not a joker thing to do normally Very not, no. harley rescues the joker he never rescues well, that's her. what i'm saying it's much more of a bonnie and clyde but thing if yeah. he's up to something if he's yeah. setting her up for something he's right. going to do right then there might be a reason for him to do that so that I want that other shoe to drop before we can have a better sense of what's going what's on going with on. him. So there's just, it goes back to that thing I was saying about where yeah. we don't know enough about him to analyze. I really felt like we didn't have enough to, so we don't, we refer to him, but we don't say a lot about okay. that version. Yeah. My, my take on that version based on one movie. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, was that they were going for that natural born killers. Like these two are deeply in crazy love. And even though they're psycho and all that, they will, break each other out although you know? interesting thing yeah. that you do bring up bonnie and clyde because we do one chapter in there yeah. a criminal justice expert uh, she makes ex- an explicit comparison between bonnie and clyde and the joker and harley she goes through comparing their histories mm. and what happens with them uh, and, and it's a very interesting comparison uh, well and they, they're, they're, the traditional joker harley relationship i i think doesn't really live up to bonnie and clyde because Bonnie and Clyde always got the sense like they 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 were dedicated to going out together. Mm-hmm. And other than that Suicide Squad movie, the Joker's always like, yeah, if you're there, fine. If you're not there, fine. But Harley wants to go out with the Joker. You know what I mean? Like it's more one sided. Right. Yeah, for the most part, that gets yeah. addressed as an abusive relationship. Yeah, it really is. You know, it, it is. It's codependent, abusive, and all those things. So there, this is interesting. I just I just uh, flipped open to a random page. Uh, and and the I guess the chapter name is which Joker? 
Mm-hmm. Uh, That's and, chapter one. Chapter one. And there's you loosely relate qualities to uh, the Joker's five major eras. And mm-hmm. I think it's important for people to understand Joker's been around for like 75 years. He came out a year 80, after. 80 next year. 80 next year. So he debuted in Batman number one which was roughly a year after Detective Comics 27. Mm-hmm. So he came along roughly a year after yeah, Spring Batman. of 1940. Right. So in the Joker has probably been one of the most reinvented or mercurial characters or whatever in uh, comics history as far as who he is in each era. It's like, yeah, it's an amazing yeah. thing how yeah. well the Joker can adapt to any story, well, any he's, era. Well, he's kind of a trickster archetype, right? Mm-hmm. Or, I, you know, he's... He kind of perfectly is suited to be whatever you need him to be. I, I like him best personally, and I'll and I'll go through your five uh, eras here. But I loved in the Dark Knight, the second Nolan movie, where he just appears, and they're like, his clothing is all custom. We got nothing on. We don't know. We don't get. We got nothing. He this nothing. Like his clothing doesn't tell us anything. Nothing about him tells us anything. And it's almost like he just materialized out of chaos. And that's my favorite kind of Joker. It really doesn't matter where he came from. It really doesn't matter what his origin is. In in a lot of ways, it doesn't matter what his motivations are because he's not going to change. Right. So you just got to deal with what he is right then. Right. Right. There should never be a definitive origin for the Joker. I agree with that because it limits. Well, in in the graphic novel, The Killing Joke. Uh, Alan Moore had given this backstory for the Joker. Right. And Len Wein told him that this is good, but you have to make it if here. So the Joker adds this, the, Alan adds this line right. late in it where the Joker says, Sometimes I remember it one way, sometimes another. If I have to have a past, I prefer it to be multiple choice. Then right. in The Dark Knight, the Joker gives one version of his background. Yeah. That bothered me. But then he gives the second version yeah. completely incompatible. Yeah. It's like, all right, they're doing the multiple choice. Right. And the third one, he doesn't get to finish the story because Batman's not buying into the crap. Right. Why you pull he for just Batman. punches him I, or whatever. I kind of wanted to know what the third line <laughs> was going to be. for the sheer entertainment value of it. Yeah. So we've got, uh, so here's, here's how you define mm-hmm. the Joker's five major eras. The Ace of Knaves. That's which is the when Joker he first, in his first two years. Right. That he was he was usually called the Grim Jester or the Killer Clown at the time, which really fit him. The Ace of Knaves is a nickname that came along later for him, mm-hmm. but it suits his place as the Ace, the first of the colorful supervillains that would replace the mad scientists right. and monsters that the ser- heroes had been fighting. He is often called the first supervillain. People will argue that, but that's that's the reason for calling him that. But he's a murderer in those first two, first two years. He's killing people. You don't always know why. Sometimes they die 24 hours after he's actually robbed them. So mm-hmm. it's not part of the crime. It's not part of the M.O. to get the jewel when he already stole the jewel. Uh, so you don't really know. He's depicted as sane, but inscrutable. We don't know what's up with this guy. It's almost more like a Moriarty, but more colorful. And and uh, Jerry Robinson, one of his ideas in creating the Joker had been that he should be a Moriarty for Batman. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Uh, Well, there's so much stuff we could get into. Uh, Initially, they wanted to kill him off. He, they, yeah. they wrote in, in, yeah. in, in Batman number one. There are two Joker stories. In the second one, he dies at the end right. of it. And editor Whitney, Whitney Ellsworth said, "This is a great character." Yeah. And they tweak the last two panels so a doctor goes, "Oh, he's alive. He's still alive." Yeah, because the thought was that the creator, the creators, writers, or whatever, they wanted to kill him because a recurring villain they thought made Batman look inept. But the uh, editor was like, "No, you're crazy." So in the first twelve stories. Or the first 12 issues of Batman, like Joker's in like 10 of them. He's in a lot of them. The, yeah. For the those two years, Batman yeah. fights the Joker about every other month. Right. So he's the definition of an arch nemesis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you got the Ace of Knaves, which is uh, psychopathy. Because of that quality... Yeah. The quality of psych- psychopathy, the, the sheer indifference to other feeling, the the evil for the sake of evil. So an right. extreme of that, uh, that's the psychological quality out of what's called this dark tetrad that really stands out with him at that time. All right. And then you've got uh, the clown prince of crime, which is narcissism. Um, yeah. and so well, what, he's putting his face on everything. Right. His face on his car. It's going to be a long time before he puts them on fish, but yes, he's putting yeah. on every single device he can. He, he's even worse than Batman about right. putting his face on things. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then you got King of Arkham Asylum, uh, 
which is insanity. Uh, in 1973, yeah. Denny O'Neill decided the Joker should be considered insane. And, he, he had not killed anyone for 31 years. Right. He wanted him to start killing again. And and it was and his approach was that the Joker is insane. And what, it's been part of it ever since. I, it fits to me. I mean, it's, it, he works as a completely insane. Just, you know, and insane is a, uh, I'm, I'm sure... You know, you you know this uh, with your background. Insane is actually a legal term, right? Right. Not an actual real psychology term. Right. right? And, you know, and he fits insanity as we commonly think of it. However, in terms of a legal term, when the legal term is that you don't understand the rightness and wrongness of what you're doing due to mental defect. Well, he does know people consider these things he just wrong. Doesn't care. That's what's fun about <laughs> yeah, it. That's for him. Fun. Yeah, that's what's fun. Yeah. If he didn't. If he wasn't like a threat to society, he would be actually a very fun guy. <laughs> yeah, he's just, details. He'd, he'd details. Be, yeah, he'd be just sort of like a you know entertainer running around. He'd be like an Andy Kaufman, but a dark kind of Andy Kaufman, <laughs> right? I, I see that comparison. Yeah, yes. yeah. But he does kill, so we don't we don't like that. Uh, the Harlequin of Hate, which is mm-hmm. uh, Machiavellianism. He becomes very manipulative in the late uh, 20th century. Right. Uh, after Crisis on Infinite Earth changes their reality in the mid-80s, the Joker starts getting more manipulative. He also gets more cruel. I, I do have to note that the sadism and the Machiavellianism mm-hmm. really go together with mm-hmm. him. But that's when you start to see him manipulate more people more. He, the, the killing joke, he's doing all of what he's doing to try to make some kind of complicated point about right. good and evil. He starts manipulating Harley Quinn in the cartoons during that time, and then she enters right. the comics. So he starts getting getting so much more manipulative and forming a little bit more of long-term plans than he used to in that point. All right. Uh, So those are the five kind of major eras of the Joker. And, you know, uh, he fits all of them almost equally well, Mm -hmm. right? Like I said, he's a a very mercurial type character. Um, and, And I guess we were talking earlier that it was really kind of hard to write a book about the Joker without Harley Quinn also. Right. Because even though it doesn't really give deeper insight to his motivations, I guess it does give a little bit better in because she grounds him a little bit. There's a grounding mm-hmm. factor there to the real world. Uh, I guess it just gives a little bit better. Like, why, why, why would you say that Harley Quinn makes him more understandable to write well, about? She is someone that we know about her thoughts and the things she do, does. She is an actual relationship she is somebody recurring in his life, and even when they're not together, she's still connected to him, and it actually gives someone with an on- ongoing connection other than the guy in the bat suit that he keeps making trouble for. I mean, those are right. the people that he has ongoing interest in. Bit of a Commissioner Gordon too. He's got some ongoing. Even when he's trying to kill other, and hurt maim other people in their lives, he's not killing and maiming Batman and Gordon. Well, the interesting thing is. The Killing Joke is actually much more about Gordon than it is Batman. Mm-hmm. He's trying to give Gordon one bad day to see if Gordon will snap. And, and in my opinion, Gordon's the hero of The Killing Joke because right. Gordon doesn't snap. You know, he even though he has like the worst day of his entire life, he doesn't snap. You right. know, he stays Gordon and he stays on the side of law. Uh, but yeah, that is interesting that he doesn't kill Jordan, Gordon when he could easily. And uh he could, he could kill Batman. I mean, there's been plenty of opportunities where he could kill Batman. Yeah, that you know? started uh, back in 1942, uh, mm-hmm. right before uh, he st- right before he stops killing. There's this story in which he has a chance to unmask Batman and end his career, and then he decides, well, "What fun would that be?" Yeah, yeah. What's the fun of that? And there's also multiple versions of the the Joker have prevented somebody else from either unmasking or killing Batman mm-hmm. because he's like, nope, that's mine. You know, yep. so he yeah. has done that in uh, the 70s. Yeah. He was threatening a mob boss. Yeah. Uh, here you've learned the identity. Well, if, if you try to re- reveal it, I'll kill you. Right. Yeah. 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 There's all this, all this. It's it's a very complicated uh, thing, you know, with that the relationship between Joker and Batman. And, you know, I, I've read The Dark Knight Returns over and over throughout times of my life. Mm hmm. And, you know, I, di- I didn't really pick up till later, like the first few times I read it as like a teenager and young adult and all that. I didn't really pick up on this. But, you know, as when I read it as an adult, you know, Frank Miller gave a outright direct sort of sexual tension on the Joker's behalf when he's like, oh, we're finally going to go all the way because he wanted Batman to kill him. 
And 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 uh, and I know it can be interpreted different ways, but that seemed to me very much like an analog for like we're finally going to do it, you know. And it's funny because yeah. Frank Miller's view is actually that the Joker has no sexual feelings; that right. sex is life, right? And life to him is is death. It's like he he he. His approach was yeah. that the Joker does not actually have those feelings. So then, well, what's is the Joker just messing with Batman? Well, I think that it's the Joker in that sense was so messed up. That's the closest thing he could get to sexual uh, excitement was, can I get Batman to kill me? Right. Not do I kill Batman? That's boring. Can I push Batman to the point where he'll kill me? And then, of course, he just ends up. Batman paralyzes the Joker. And the Joker yeah. kills himself, but letting it look right, like Batman. Right, that Batman did it, yeah. yeah so. which, which is funny to him, though. Yeah. The Joker you know, the Joker is not somebody who's going to be consistent on his own plans, even in The Dark Knight. He seems to be generally trying to expose Batman until he decides, oh, I don't want to do that. Right, yeah, he's he's all over the place. So uh, well, i got to get us to a break when we come back. Uh, you know, maybe uh, I'd like to hear maybe, do you have a personal favorite version of the Joker? Mm. Um, one of, one of my things that uh, we spoke briefly about this at, uh, Little Rock Comic Con. In fact, now you're going to be at, are you going to be at Arkansas Comic Con in a week? No, no? I will okay. be at Tulsa Comic Con. Tulsa Comic Con. Okay. So you folks, uh, you can catch Dr. Langley, Travis Langley. And, and, I, and I will tell you, I've bumped into him many times at conventions he is supremely and approachable and friendly, and we'll chat. So come oh, up. Yeah. Yeah. I love to talk. You're you're what you're the type of guests that I go to cons for. I don't go to cons for the guests that I have to wait in line for an hour and then I get a two second happy meal interaction. <laughs> right? That doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. But you're the person. You're the kind of person you can come up and just chat with. So uh, if you see Travis Langley at a, at a con, definitely walk up and say hi. And we're talking about the Joker psychology, evil clowns. And the women who love them, uh, edited by Travis Langley. Uh, you said you did about eighty percent of the actual content, and then it's got a forward by Michael Uslan, uh, who's the Batman film franchise mm-hmm. executive producer. So very cool. Uh, just want to throw out some quick show notes. Forgot to mention earlier. If you have a question or anything for Doctor Langley, uh, you can call five zero one eight two three zero nine six five. If you have, if you're listening to the podcast or uh, Crypto Radio version, and you, and you have a question or comment you know tweet me at shane plays and i'll I'll get it to him uh the show notes if you're listening to the podcast version the show notes for today's show will be up at shameplays.com that's s-h-a-n-e-p-l-a-y-s.com and the last week's show is archived on the blog and out there in the podcastosphere and that was episode 197 black hops hair trigger with local comics creators timothy Lim and mark pellegrini and then again the show does go out as a podcast after the radio version and it goes out on the blog goes iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Pod, Podbean, SoundCloud, YouTube, and more. And last but never least, Shane Plays is carried on Krypton Radio. Krypton Radio is sci-fi for your Wi-Fi. KryptonRadio.com. Oh, yeah, I want to remind people, uh, my book, Dungeons & Desktops, The History of Computer Role-Playing Games, second edition, co-written with uh, Matt Barton, uh, Dr. Matt Barton of Matt Chat fame, is out. It's been out. It's doing well, getting good reviews. And you can find that on Amazon. And, and again, that's a history of computer role-playing games, second edition, uh, which adds just a ton of content and revisions to the first edition. And don't forget, Arkansas RPG Con is coming November 9th and 10th. Get on over to ARPGCon.com and get your tickets today. Uh, Zach, real quick, we'll do a real quick Zach banter. Just wanted to, you know what, you know what's coming, Zach, is, is football is coming. Washita Baptist football. That is right. So we'll be, we're going to be doing the same thing this year we did last year, where we'll actually be taking a hiatus during football. So I think it's the last Saturday in September there'll be a football game, and then we'll be back on the air sometime early November. I think it's um yeah, or or maybe it's November. I think. Are you talking about the last game of the season? The last. Okay, so we'll be the first football game is like the last Saturday of September. We will not be on the air because there's a oh, football game, gotcha. and then we'll be back sometime early November or mid November, depending. Because last couple of years they've gone into playoffs. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. They lost a lot of key players. So we'll see with the team. See what happens. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm 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 doomed because that's going to be several weeks of of no. Zach Banter and and Sal's grandmother and her dog Muffin are going to be way, way angry, <laughs> and we're going to have to put Sal in therapy over over the over what's been going on. He still won't come out of the newsroom, man. <laughs> so it's crazy. 
Hey, one thing I was going to ask you, um, I don't know if this is your jam or not. This might be Dr. Langley's jam. You guys hear about this Masters of the Universe Revelation thing coming to Netflix? Uh, only that it's coming. Only this, are you are you in a Masters of the Universe at all, Zach? I don't think I've ever heard of that before. You never heard of Masters of the Universe? He-Man? Oh, he oh, man. okay, now. Okay, okay yes, now is it now. clicking? All right. So this is kind of cool, actually. They've rebooted the show a couple of times over the years, but this is Masters of the Universe Revelation. It's coming to Netflix, and it's going to continue right where it left off 35 mm-hmm. years ago. Same storyline and everything. Kevin Smith is the executive producer and showrunner. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. Uh, and, and, you know, and there's a lot of fans that are very like, oh, they're going back to finish the original storyline. So there's people excited about that. And I guess it, it, it's going to involve everybody, but it's going to be kind of She-Ra centric from what I understand. So, Well, she is doing well on Netflix. Yes. And people, people love She-Ra. Those yeah. I haven't seen it, but I, I hear people either. so excited about it. I've seen so many She-Ra cosplayers lately. Really? Yeah. yeah. But she's, of course, of course, She-Ra and... He man were in the same universe. They were brother and sister. Yeah, but although they, they were on different planets. Yeah, they had like basically the same concept, but one you know same show basically. But you had a a, a, a you know you had she wrote the woman and Prince Adam, you know the, the He Man and and okay. and anyway, so so that that's coming at some at some some point. So have you seen any movies lately, Zach? I just you, drew a blank. You just drew a blank. Yes, I did. Oh my goodness, asking me that question. Did, Lion King. Lion King. What'd yes. you think? Live action Lion King. It was actually good. You liked it? It surprised me. Are you a fan of the original? That's my all-time favorite movie. Well, boom. Okay, so. That's why I was kind of hesitant. You were hesitant, but you liked it? All right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and get us to a break so when we get back, we can talk more about the Joker, psychology, evil clowns, and the women who love them. Comic book lovers, visit the wildstars.com today from the mind of author and comic book industry expert michael tierney it's not just a comic book it's a comic book novel the wild stars is sci-fi and so much more learn the explanations behind ufos and space gods this isn't the twilight zone this is the region of the milky way galaxy known as the wild stars we guarantee you've never read anything like it the complete comic book novel took 20 years to tell with one reviewer noting, the story of the Wild Stars stretches ambitiously across space and time, from small town murders to the destruction of planets, with every event given multiple layers of meaning. If you haven't read The Wild Stars, you're missing out. Visit thewildstars.com today. Are you a fan of thrilling adventure, daring suspense, and just a touch of romance? Kursova has you covered. Since 2016, Kursova has been publishing the very best in contemporary fantasy and science fiction, retro pulp, and for you D&D gamers, Appendix N style fiction. Based on Little Rock, you can pick up their flagship magazine locally or at Michael Tierney's The Comic Book Store on Treasure Hill Road or Collector's Edition on JFK in North Little Rock. Swing by one of Michael's stores and pick up an issue or find them on Amazon. C I R S O V A. Not doesn't start with a K. It starts with a C. C I R S O V A. Cursova Magazine. Check them out today. You want to go ahead and throw out some love to Game Goblins? Some goblins are your friends. Game Goblins is Central Arkansas's premier retailer of Magic: The Gathering, Warhammer 40K board games, card games, RPGs, miniatures, and hobby accessories. Call Game Goblins at 501 224 Game. Or visit them online at GameGoblins.com. That's 501-224-GAME or GameGoblins.com. Conveniently located 1121 South Bowman, right on the corner of Bowman and Canis in West Little Rock, and staffed by friendly employees, Game Goblins has expanded their store size, and there's plenty of room for exciting inventory and tables for play space. You'll like that space because Game Goblins has gaming events every day of the week. For all of your gaming needs, I hardly recommend Game Goblins. Make sure to check out their customer loyalty program that rewards you based on your actual purchases. Game Goblins earns your business and keeps it. First time customers, mention Shane Plays and receive $10 off your purchase of $50 or more. Tell them Shane Plays sent you. And folks, if you do visit any of my sponsors, please tell them that you hear about them on the show. That helps them know uh, that their advertising money and the relationship we've built is, is time and money well spent. 
Shane Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors, and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual? For as little as $1 an episode, simply go to patreon.com slash Shane Plays. Hey, welcome back to Shane Plays Geek Talk Journey. Into the things we love, I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Thanks so much for listening. You can call in at 501-823-0965. We've got roughly 15 minutes left, just under 15. Time goes so fast on the radio. It just flies. Uh, and I I couldn't derail the show with this, but uh, my guest, Travis Langley, Dr. Travis Langley, uh, the superhero-ologist on Twitter, was telling me about the time he went on Wheel of Fortune I, I could probably do a whole show on that. That fascinates me, game <laughs> shows. But but he but he had fun and he did well. And you know maybe maybe some other time I'll be able to get to tell that story. Also, we're now uh, just kind of playing around with doing the live video broadcast on the Dave Ellswick Show Facebook page. So if you're curious to see what it looks like to actually be in the studio and and my guests and everything, you can check that out. The reason I'm doing it again is because last week I checked the numbers and. They were actually higher than I expected for people to watch the video version. So, okay, cool. Why not? Anyway, so we are talking about the Joker psychology, uh, which is the latest in a series of psychology books uh, that Dr. Langley has either written or edited that, that, that explore psychology through pop culture characters and topics, anything from Batman to The Walking Dead to Star Trek to Westworld, to the Joker, you name it. It all started with Batman. And this has been the most requested character since then that people are like, are you going to do the Joker? So there's there's a question I'm going to ask you in a second, Dr. Langley, that, that leads into a topic both of us find interesting about one of the people you interviewed. But before we get to there, I got to know, do you have a favorite Joker incarnation or a style of Joker? like Mark Hamill. Yeah, it's he he captured the essence of the character. He's adaptable too. He can play it lighter for a lighter story. He can play it sinister and scary, especially when he does video games. So that yeah. gets the. But also, Batman the animated series had the advantage of getting to tell lots of stories, mm-hmm. the smaller stories that really play to Batman's strengths. Uh, yeah, when you get to it, you've got to go with Mark Hamill in terms of live action. It depends on the stories. They're not interchangeable. You can't take Cesar Romero and put him in the Dark Knight. You can't take. It wouldn't work, no. You, you can't take no. Ledger or Leto and, and put them in the 66 series. Nicholson might have been able to do in the 66 series. He, he was younger then. But so, so they're not interchangeable. The version of the Joker is the one that's right for that story and that version of Batman. Mm hmm. That that's true. So let's change the question. Do you have a favorite style of Joker? Not if it, you know what I'm saying, because they can say, okay, that one fits that genre, or that fits that medium. But do you have a favorite type of Joker? In terms of the comics, I yeah. really love the way Danny O'Neill, the seventies Joker, and Steve Englehart, yeah, the seventies, yeah, the seventies Joker. 70s Joker. Yeah. yeah, that's when he's getting crazy and you don't really understand him. His plans aren't quite as complicated. He's going on his temporary crime spree and it plays to Batman's strengths right. as opposed to, well, here's this epic that has to cross over through five titles and therefore right. a total of 30 issues making Batman and everybody else just look stupid for not stopping him sooner. Right. Uh, I, I, so the stories I like are also those that play to Batman's strengths. Back when they had the one and two part stories more frequently, as opposed to they all have to be arcs to fill a trade paperback. Mm-hmm. The, this, the heroes got to look not quite as dumb. Yep. Yeah. And so I, I really like the way Denny and Steve Englehart wrote the Joker in the 70s. So which Joker, which era, I, I feel like it was on a it was on the cusp of a transition, but what which Joker out of the five Jokers that you defined, or you know, in the book that we talked about earlier, the, the eras of the Joker, which one beat Robin to death with a crowbar? Oh, that would have been in the uh, Harlequin of Hate period. Uh, that is one of the things. During that time, the Joker starts doing things that affect the lives of people in Batman's and Gordon's lives. Uh, before that... His victims, anybody he killed, they probably first appeared in that story and never again because they didn't really matter personally mm-hmm. right. to Batman and Gordon beyond their love of all human beings. But in the in the late eighties and the nineties, the Joker changed. He started doing the he paralyzes Barbara Gordon. He beats Jason 
Todd, the second Robin, with the crowbar and then leads him to get blown up. He, at the end of the 20th century, uh, killed Gordon's second wife. Mm. He he shot uh, Dick Grayson, ending mm. his career as Robin in that revised version of that background. Before, he, So he's repeatedly doing things in uh, their lives at that point. It becomes a personal thing. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, fair enough. I, You know, one thing I would love to see, there's never been a version of the Joker that was like made me laugh out loud, funny. I'm 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 really really curious to see if a writer can come along and keep him a villain that's really evil, but also at the same time make him laugh out loud funny. Because up to now, I think part of the thing of the Joker is he's not funny. He calls himself the Joker, but he's really not funny. No, it's funny to him. Yeah, I wonder if you can take that character. And literally keep make me laugh out loud, but at the same time, I'm like, this guy is awful. He know? has his, although yeah. the Lego Joker's kind of funny. The which one? Lego Batman. His oh, he's of the great. Joker. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but he's Was not. Was that Zach Galifianakis? I'm not sure who does yeah. that, but I don't count. I mean, I count that as a Joker, but I don't count that as. It's a good, yeah. honestly, it gets into some of the issues yeah. of their relationship in a way nobody else has explored it. Yeah, well, the whole, yeah, the the, the Batman movie really went into, he's like, but I'm your I'm your favorite villain. I or, hate you. I hate you more. Yeah, it's exactly. like that, that personal yeah. moment at the end. All right. So, uh, okay, we got. About five six minutes here, so I want to I want to give a chance. What do we? Give? Yeah, t- so I want to go into this now. Tell me about Michael Uslan and the forward and and your relationship. So, so there. Michael is the executive producer of all the Batman movies. He spent ten years trying to get the first one made. When you see things such as Batman ampersand Robin, that's because Michael had to give up a lot of control to the studio to get those films made. Mm. Uh, but. We first met because of the Joker. Uh, well, let me just say, you know. if you watch Batman and Robin as camp. It kind of works, uh, like he's pulling out the back credit card and all that. It it wasn't meant to be that. I think people expect a different movie than right. what Batman that, and Robin is. That series was not meant to be that. That was right. his big frustration. Is right. when it went back to the TV show level of camp. Right. Uh, so we did a panel in 2009 about the Joker, talking about whether he's a psychopath, and that's where I met Michael was during that panel. And I recruited Jerry Robinson, creator of the Joker, co-creator. I, I I got Adam West to join us for that particular panel. You tell me about Adam West. And, Adam and, was a really yeah. Adam was a great guy. A good sense of humor. Loved his fans. And after that first time we did that panel, we had talked several times before. We had conversations to get ready for the panel. And so it it's fun when I first get that phone call from Adam West. His yeah. daughter had been arranging this. I'm in the middle of a crowded place, and the, the call dropped. I oh! look at my phone. This mental no. <laughs> But Adam called back, nice. blaming his crappy phone. Yeah, and so after that, we did that panel together. When I would see him for a while, I would think, "Okay, this is going to be the time he doesn't remember me." He's Professor Travis. Oh, cool. And he would usually call me Doc, which is a good cover if you don't remember the name. Right. But, but when he did call, oh, he does remember the name. Yeah. So since he did remember a name, Doc was like a nickname. The very last time I saw him, I was arranging for him to meet Athena Finger, granddaughter of Bill Finger, sure. who created most of what we consider to be Batman. And he didn't know I was the one that set it up. He said, Travis, how the hell are you, Doc? Hmm. He, was a, he was a fun guy. Anytime I've met somebody who said, well, I met Adam West. And he was kind of a jerk. I always say, was it late in the day? Yeah. He's late, tired. <laughs> late in the day when he's tired, yeah. his sarcastic sense of humor doesn't quite come across right. right. Yeah. I, I say it in present tense. Right. Uh, but yeah, it, was, I, he, it was such an honor and fun to get to know my childhood Batman as a person. And more importantly, that he knew me. Well, there's there's actually an entire transcript in here mm-hmm. uh, of a of a discussion you have yes. with Adam. There's there's a lot of stuff in here that this book, uh, the Joker psychology, evil clowns, and the women who love them, isn't just sort of a psychological approach, but you you get a lot of insight into the people who either played or created right. Batman and and what their opinion was or what they were going for. There's I, women who fall for serial killers. There's mm-hmm. just as you flip through this. This is a this is one of those books that people who love to read about comic book history, people who love to read about true crime, people who love to read about um, why criminals are criminals. I mean, this is this is fascinating stuff. And, you know, I predict this is going to be one of your better. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing they all sell pretty well. But this one's probably going to be a big one. You know? Yeah, they all do well, although after yeah. all this time, the Batman book is still the most popular one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Batman's Batman, you know. He's Batman. He, I'm Batman. Yeah. What's it? What's that part where he goes? I'm not wearing hockey pants or whatever. <laughs> I'm not wearing hockey pants. Um, all right. So, 
do you have and we got four minutes left and i'm i'm throwing you out there because all you have so far is trailers but do you have any opinion on the joaquin phoenix joker movie that's coming out i'm kind of intrigued by it. originally i was i was i was hopeful yeah. my, my, my first thought had been why in the world are you doing a joker origin story right but it's, it's it's a joker they're not worried about it being the definitive story so uh, 10 years ago i would have said no wait now people have seen enough different versions between different movies the proto jokers right. and finally a joker on the tv show gotham which was awesome yeah, and, that uh, kid they got to do Cameron Monaghan. Man, he's great, dude. The first time he did the Joker laugh mm-hmm. when when he was pretending to be innocent, and then he swapped at the end. And the, my wife had nightmares. She's like, he's like possessed. That was beautiful when he, he did is that. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think now is a time to play around with just a different Joker. And I'm hearing really good buzz from the people who've seen it. The Joaquin. Yeah, I, I'm into it. Like. I, I try to take movies on their own merit, mm-hmm. and, and they come out and said, look, 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 we're not worried about continuity. We're not. We're just trying to make a, an interesting movie, and you know, to get like I said, it kind of ties into the uh, the Gotham thing, where it wasn't necessarily the Joker. It's kind of like the spirit of Joker. Right. You know, it's kind of a and and so you know what happens when a comedian goes horribly wrong. You know, and then, yeah, the DC yeah. movies. Had to give up on their continuity because yeah. they they failed yeah. at that. Um, Mar- they wanted to do what Marvel's done very successfully with their right. movie continuity. Just do a good story. Deadpool doesn't worry about where it fits into continuity right. and works really well. He just has fun. Yeah. Well, I, I will say, I don't know, the Joker, where, like, well, we could do a whole show on the Heath Ledger Joker and... Man, that was just that agent of chaos, psychopath. That was so. Yeah, that's the fifth stage. Yeah, just so the so one for crazy. the twenty first century. And you'll notice it's one of the few superhero movies where they didn't kill the villain at the end, but yet then tragically Heath Ledger yeah. died. You know, but Which that's threw what, off the next. There's the next movie, The Trial of the Joker, was supposed to be an important part of the movie. Yeah, that's that's a shame that that we didn't get that. And you know, I, I hate for anybody to die. You know, Heath Ledger's a real person. Yeah. So the tragedy that he's gone is deeper than the tragedy that we didn't get more Joker on film. But the whole thing is just one big tragedy. Right. So because that was magnificent, his portrayal of the Joker. Um, all right. Well, we've got what do we got about a minute left? All right. So I got I got to do this to you, Dr. Langley. Mm-hmm. Doc, Doc Langley. So if we ever make a time travel movie, you're going to be Doc Langley. OK. Does that work for you? All right. So Shaney. <laughs> Shaney, I'll have a, uh, a roughly vest and a skateboard. Yeah, It's your kids, Shane. Um, all right, so I got to do the bad joke of the week. I hope you sign the waiver. Uh, or maybe we could do a, a book on the psychology of the bad joke of the week. Uh, okay, so the Joker movie was just confirmed to have an R rating. And that's good because without the R, it would have been just a joke. <laughs> that's the bad... That's the bad joke of the week. All right. I well, like it. As, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, you're always welcome on the show, whether you want to talk about one of your books or just want to just chat comics, whatever. I do that pretty often. Folks, it's the Joker psychology, evil clowns, and the women who love them, edited and written in a large part by Dr. Travis Langley. Doc, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. All right, folks, we'll catch you next week on Shame Place. <laughs> Question. Would you die for me? Yes. That's too easy. Will you... Would you live for me? Hmm? Yes. Careful. Do not say this oath thoughtlessly. Desire becomes surrender, surrender becomes power. You want this? I do. Say it. Say it. Say it. Pretty, 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 pretty. Please. God, you're so good. Shame Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors, and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as $1 an episode? Simply go to patreon.com slash shameplays.